in tonight's program, and that is the global launch of the Alliance for Water Stewardship Standard. And here I would like to introduce Michael Spencer, AWS Board Chair. Michael. Thank you, Gavin, and good afternoon, and welcome, everybody. Uh, can everyone hear up the back? Is the audio fine up there? Yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, buenas tardes, señoras y señores. Bienvenidos. Can I acknowledge all the attend in attendees here at this week's CEO Water Mandate? Our local guests who are joining us specifically for this evening's presentations, and in particular, representatives from the Peruvian National Water Authority and the Ministry of Agriculture, who we've had some very productive conversations with over the last uh, couple of days. I'm sure members of the mandate would have gained an insight into the water issues being faced in Peru on the field trip today. They're issues I've been acutely aware of since I first visited Peru about 20 years ago when I had a real job in the corporate sphere as well. Today we look forward to working with uh, government agencies here in Peru, working with our local industry partners and with Peruvian civil society on solutions to these difficult and vital water issues. Which brings us to our first speaker tonight. The Alliance has had a focus on local partners and bottom-up solutions. We're building some strong local partnerships. In India, for example, <coughs> we've been working with a number of organisations, one of which is Terry, the Energy and Resources Institute. Terry is an organisation of some 1,200 people. Part of their philosophy is reliance on entrepreneurial skills to create benefits for society through the development and dissemination of intellectual property. The Director General of Terry is Dr. Rajendra Pachari, who many of you would know from his work as the chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, the International Authority on Climate Change Science. People in Peru will of course be hearing a lot more about climate change over the course of this year as they prepare to host the 20th Conference of the Parties. Dr. Pachari's work, of course, has been recognised by kings, by presidents, by prime ministers from his native India as well as Mexico, Finland, Japan and Belgium. In 2007, along with the former US Vice President Al Gore, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for Global Leadership on Climate Change. In his message to us tonight, Dr. Pachari builds on his experience with climate change to illustrate the common lessons in dealing with water. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to say a few words on this occasion, and I believe it's very important to focus on some of the themes, the philosophy, and the approaches being practiced by AWS. In this regard, let me say, even in the context of climate change, in the fourth assessment report of the IPCC, we had clearly said that placing a price on carbon would perhaps be the best instrument for bringing about mitigation of emissions of greenhouse gases. And the reason for that is because if you have a price on a scarce commodity or product, then clearly it sends a very powerful market signal on the basis of which individuals, companies, governments can take action to ensure that you treat that commodity as being scarce. And this leads to research and development for more efficient use of that particular commodity or for that matter even methods by which you can bring about substitution with other sources of supply that would make sure that you are able to bring about a balance in the market. I should also emphasize the fact that in order to bring about an improvement in the current situation and to see that some of the global challenges that we are facing can be met effectively, we really need all stakeholders to get involved. 
and that clearly includes the private sector because in the absence of the private sector getting signals, getting involved in finding solutions, we would clearly find that policies remain hollow because in the ultimate analysis, the global economic activity that we see is to a large extent in the hands of the private sector. And therefore, we must use the strengths of the private sector. It needs hardly to be mentioned that when private organizations get involved, then they bring about much greater efficiency in the use of a large number of activities. But of course, we would need regulation because water being a scarce resource and common property is something that you cannot allow the private sector to take undue advantage of. Therefore, I would say the involvement of the private sector should be accompanied by the development and functioning of regulatory institutions. And this is something that we need to bring about in order to ensure that there is fairness to the consumer and certainly fairness to the producer of any commodity, including water. AWS's ability to bring about changes at the local level is most commendable because unless we have local involvement in solving some of the most intractable problems in the world, we clearly would falter, we would fail. And I think the message has to go down. The systems by which we bring about efficiency improvements and a solution to global problems has to emanate from action at the local level. And therefore, I would submit that while we may have approaches at the global level, at the national level, and even the sub-national level, in the ultimate analysis, there has to be an effort from the ground upwards by which we can ensure that the aggregate problems that we are facing on this planet can be solved effectively. I personally would like to see Terry work very closely with AWS and this is something that my colleagues I'm sure will be discussing on this occasion and in future because I believe our goals are very similar, the values that we pursue are identical and therefore we are looking for alliances, we are looking for partnerships because after all we are all in this together. As Kenneth Boulding rightly said, we are all residents of spaceship Earth. And unless we work together, then clearly we would have enormous confusion on this spaceship, something that we must all avoid and something that we have to solve through partnerships, through collaboration and cooperative activity. So I'd like to thank you all and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. So thank you to Terry and Dr. Pachari who actually recorded that video in the same week. He released the report on impacts and vulnerabilities of climate change. So it was a pretty busy week for him and we really appreciate him going to the effort to do that. He spoke about resource efficiency early in that presentation and I was also interested to note that the um, McKinsey co Company monthly update this month actually emphasised the same issue around resource efficiency and I think dealing with the sort of issues that we're dealing with can uh, stimulate innovation uh, which is going to be how, how we will ultimately solve the problems in water and carbon and the other natural resource management issues we've got. He spoke about many of the important elements of the stewardship offer that, that we're talking about tonight. He talks about the importance of voluntary market-based solutions, the importance of involving the private sector in finding solutions to our water problems. Government, as we keep talking to government about, can't solve these problems alone. And he talks about the importance of bottom-up solutions that start from a local level and involve local stakeholders. So today is in part celebration, part information and part launch of the next stage in the development of water stewardship. We recognise and celebrate the work of our 15 member, independent, multi-stakeholder, international standard development committee who worked for the past two years developing the, world, the world's first global water stewardship standard a standard for understanding, implementing and evaluating good water stewardship. We want to tell you a little bit about the new standard and for those who were with us in Mumbai where we launched the BETA standard, tell you a little bit, a little bit about what's different between this version and the previous version and how it's been improved. Alexis Morgan, 
who supported the International Standard Development Committee. He lived and breathed this project for the past four years. We'll talk to you about that soon. We've also asked Adrian Sim, our International Executive Director, to talk to you about where we're going from here, how we're building capacity in the system, and how we are creating opportunities for you to get involved as implementers of the system, as promoters of good water stewardship within your communities or supply chains, as supporters, and as part of the organisation that will continue to build and develop the system. But first, Alexis, our International Standards Development Coordinator. Alexis. That's a video? Second. Next one. Uh, Alexis. No. no, 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 not the video, this one. one. More. This, this presentation. That one. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And if you just bring it up to the screen. Some more? Thank okay. you. Thanks. After you, Mike. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I uh, wanted to begin this evening's presentation with an image of uh, a number of individuals. Um, and those individuals are some of the members of the group that Michael mentioned a moment ago, the International Standard Development Committee. There are several of those members here this evening. Um, and they represented the kind of multi-stakeholder group that has helped to put together this, this document that is in front of us today. In many ways, they embody part of the journey. This group traveled around the planet um, as all of us uh, have to get here, um, whether you're traveling down the street or traveling across nations. We've been on a journey to get here today to launch this, and the past four years have been a journey on developing the notion of water stewardship, defining what it is to be a good water steward. And in many ways, um, that was the task that was set out in front of us four years ago. And today, for me personally, and I think for us as a community, should really be a celebration of the achievement that we have reached this point and have now a global standard on what constitutes water stewardship. When we began that journey um, many years ago, there were many people that said this was an impossible task. Water is a local issue. How could you possibly create a global standard? And for me, it was, uh, I'm very proud to be a part of this community because the people that are within this room, many of whom contributed to the development of this document, really sort of were told that and said, no, we're going to do this. Um, and over the course of several years, people really inputted and helped make this a very local solution that was flexible to work in any country, for any sector, and for whatever size organization you are. And I think that's a really powerful element that the standard is almost universal. It's not perfect, and it, you know it will continue to be an evolving document. But it is an incredibly flexible document that's not only a standard but a framework for defining good water stewardship. So, what does this standard look like ultimately? Um, I, I'm not going to walk through the, the gory details. Obviously, we've got you know food and drink, and this is a celebration. All of you have, hopefully, a, a copy of the document. There's a miniature version here. And I will emphasize that this document um, is only it's most of the, well, it's all of the standard, but it's only part of the entire document. There are actually three appendices included ultimately in the full version of this. Only the first of those appendices is included here. There is a guidance document um, and also a, a document, or a, sorry, a, an appendix that outlines the relationship with Global Reporting Initiative and CDP as well. And those two supplementary documents as part of the standard are actually critical in its interpretation. But briefly, for those of you who are not familiar with the standard, it's essentially structured around uh, a continuous improvement cycle. There are six steps that you see here. And those really are uh, part of a, a journey where it can be applied in, in any different circumstance. 
there are different criteria that are embedded in each of those. And as you can see here, there are some core expectations. And that's what these core criteria represent. In addition to those, there are a number of what we have termed advanced criteria. And these advanced criteria outline um, various actions that people can take to perform even above and beyond. We recognize that water stewardship is a journey for everybody. Nobody starts by doing amazing things. And you know the, the organizations that are leading the charge, many of whom are represented here in this room and are members and endorsers of the CEO water mandate, have gone on their own journeys. And you can talk to any of them about those respective journeys. And so part of this notion is to encourage that, that journey and recognize that people are continually improving in this exercise. In addition, um, one of the things that I think the standard does, and it's an important piece of this landscape, is that the last number of years have seen the development of many, many different tools, whether we're talking about things like the water risk filter or aqueduct or um, various terms, the aqua gauge, the this, the that. There have been many different tools and initiatives developed in this space, many of which add significant value. But they've also added a degree of confusion. And I think one of the really powerful things that the standard does and the guidance information behind it does is it makes sense of that landscape. It connects actions, water stewardship actions, to those different tools and says, if you're looking to undertake this action, here are some of the tools and guidance documents, including those from the mandate and other sources, that can help you achieve that action. So it, it's a reference point and a framework. It's something that's freely downloadable and ultimately will be accompanied by a verification system. System. This is really important because one of the pieces that the standard always sought to do was to not only define good water stewardship, but also say, you know, if you are a, a site that is implementing this, and it is designed for sites to take actions within their facilities and beyond their facilities, how will other people know that you have actually achieved that performance? And having a verification system that accompanies that is a very important piece so that you can prove to people that are asking. It might be investors. It might be members of your supply chain or purchasers. It might be a government agency. It might be a granting authority. It might be any of these different players, public sector authorities and agencies. And the verification exercise allows you to demonstrate to those parties that you are undertaking responsible water stewardship. And that's a very powerful mechanism. It can send market signals. Um, it, it, it allows us to have a degree of robustness around the claims we are making. So for those of you who have been on this journey a little bit longer, what are some of the key changes? Because this is the third iteration of a document. Um, obviously, the guidance got built out significantly. We cleaned it up. Um, it's, it's much more robust and comprehensive at this point. The standard is um, particularly focused now around two concepts, one around addressing your shared water challenges, and secondly around mitigating your water risks. Those are two really fundamental parts of what the standard is intended to deliver, and ultimately it then leads to four different outcomes. Good water governance, improved and sustainable water balance, good water quality, and the, the sort of protection management or restoration of areas that are of significant cultural or ecological value from a water perspective. We've also included aspects of, of WASH, so access to water sanitation and hygiene. There was an inc increased emphasis on infrastructure in this version. And overall, the standard has been sort of simplified and consolidated. So in conclusion, for me, I'd li really like to just remark that for me, this is a, it's a very exciting development. I've been involved in this space for a number of years. And this is a really key piece of the landscape that all of us work on. It's literally, it's set the standard. It has, it is the standard um, on what it means to be a responsible water steward. And in particular, I think that the fact that it is accompanied or will be accompanied by a verification system that can allow you to actually demonstrate robust performance is a very, very powerful and significant piece um, to add to our collective toolkit um, that we have. So in conclusion, 
I would just like to raise a glass um, to make a toast to the completion of a journey for all of us and to the beginning of a new journey for water stewardship. So thank you. With that, um, I would like to introduce or pass back to, uh, to Michael to, to bring up our executive director. So thank you. And on behalf of the board, I think we all need to acknowledge the work that Alexis has put into this over the last couple of years and, and thank him for that work. So perhaps another round of applause for Alexis. As I mentioned before, we're now in the phase of building capacity and building out the system. So Adrian will talk to us uh, uh, fairly briefly just about the next steps for AWS. Next presentation. Uh, so good evening and um, yeah, welcome and uh, really glad you could join us on this, uh, as Alexis said, the celebration of what has been achieved so far and the, the beginning of the next phase. Um, before I, I do briefly describe the, the model that's going to be uh, supporting the delivery of the standard, just let me deviate just for a couple of minutes and echo the thanks for Alexis and Nicole and everybody else in the Secretariat who've made this happen. I wouldn't like to pass up an opportunity to publicly say it was uh, almost always a great pleasure to, to work with you and it's, uh, it's a great work done. Um, the same goes for our board who put up with a lot and uh, everybody else who've been involved, not least of which the committee, the ISTC, who've ultimately been responsible for, for putting the words on paper in the standard. So the model that we um, <coughs> are, are putting together to, as I said, support the delivery of the standard is really based on, on two key elements. One is participation and the other is, is partnership. And these are, are, I think, two fundamental things, fundamental parts of water stewardship. And, and so it's only natural that they would also underpin the model that we put together to support delivery of the standard. And these also provide the opportunities for you now to engage with us as we're, as we're going forward. Um, let me start with participation and, and go back to the ISDC, the International Standard Development Committee, because um, that actually provides, I think, a really good example of the value of participation. As Alexis said, we, we, three years ago, we got uh, 15 individuals in a room in Sri Lanka and we said to them, uh, develop us a, a, a single standard for a really contested resource that's applicable in any part of the world, in any region, in any sector. Make sure it's, uh, it delivers real impact and make sure it's cost effective in, in its uh, delivery. And they took up that challenge and really quickly learned to work to get very effectively together Although they came from all different parts of the world and all different sectors with a, a completely different range of perspectives of what, it was, what was priority and what was important. And it has been really fascinating to watch how this group has grown together and works really, has turned into a really effective problem solving group. And that really exemplifies, I think, what we are trying to put into place here with AWS is the opportunity to participate, to come together and work together to solve uh, the, the, the kinds of problems that, that Dr. Bachari and others have, have alluded to. And that's why uh, membership is such an important part of our model. Today, there hasn't been an opportunity for stakeholders to uh, engage with us institutionally or organizationally. And as we, uh, as we launch a membership structure, that's now your opportunity to, to join us and help shape the future. And it gives us the opportunity to replicate the kind of dynamics that I've just described with the ISDC. But to do that, we need to um, 
we need to make the membership accessible to the, a sufficiently broad range of organisations. So what we've done is we've, we've adopted a tiered structure whereby you can join as an associate member if you're not quite ready to, to jump in with both feet or you can join as a full member. And we're also differentiating between uh, members from developed and developing countries so that we, we, as I said, we get that broad range of participation in the membership of AWS. And if we do that, if we get that broad range of stakeholders, then we, we have a very powerful group that can be very influential. It's also a great opportunity to, to develop partnerships to actually deliver stuff on the ground and complement the kind of work that Gavin was describing with things like the, the Water Action Hub. But it's importantly the membership that will be the ultimate authority in shaping how AWS develops going forward. But it's important that, um, that the membership is also enables us to take practice, practical action on the ground. So we've, we're linking the membership to some of the other elements of our model, for example, by uh, giving members a discount on AWS training. Uh, now that training, as Michael was describing, needs to, to build the capacity of all sectors, not just those who are implementing water stewardship, but also those who are promoting, who are advocating for water stewardship. Important is that it's uh, really adopting a stepwise approach. I think Alexis touched on this, that the, uh, the standard represents pretty advanced practice, and we need to, to help and encourage and build the capacity of organizations to move along a pathway at the end of which the standard is, a, is accessible to a much broader audience. And by having this diverse group of, of stakeholders who are helping us build the, the programs and further develop the programs through our membership, we need to make sure that they, the knowledge gets, gets inputted into the content of the training program so that this, our training program always represents the latest knowledge in water stewardship and the, and the experiences uh, that have been gained from, from implementation. And again, Alexis touched on this point, it needs to be able to be integrated into other stuff you're doing. That's been uh, a ta another task for the ISDC, uh, develop a standard that can, can be incorporated into other sustainability initiatives, and our training program is also one of them. We recognize that wa water stewardship is not the only game in town. And the verification piece, as Alexis said, provides that, that ability to, to communicate effectively when the, the standard has been achieved. We have, I think I would say, about an 80% complete draft of the standard, uh, of the, the verification system. But what we've decided to do is to, to work with our first members to help build out that verification program. So there's an opportunity for you to help, help us make that, that verification what it needs to be. What we do know is it needs to be affordable. Uh, it's been a, one of the, the issues that has always been in our mind is how much is it going to cost to do this? And, it, and the verification system needs to be able to provide the level of assurance that you need depending on where you are in the journey. It needs to be able to be enable you to make those credible claims and we're following best practice, international best practice in developing the verification system as we did with the standard. And importantly, it needs to be innovative. We need to move beyond just compliance-based systems and really try and focus on impact, try and focus on continual improvement. And one of the ways we're looking at doing that is by linking the training to the verification program. And this is something which we're keen to explore as the standard gets rolled out and we develop the verification system further with our members. The AWS standard, of course, cuts across all of these pillars of the AWS model, but ultimately what we're trying to put into place here is a system through which knowledge and water stewardship is generated, is accessible, and is shared amongst stakeholders around the world. And so briefly, 
just on the on the membership. Um, as I said, the membership will be the ultimate authority in how EW is on a day-to-day -day basis by a, by, a, by a secretariat with an executive director leading that. But importantly, where are these members coming from? They're coming from primarily regional partners. So really emphasizing the point that Dr. Pachari was making that this needs to grow from the, from the, from the, the, from the local up. And so we've been putting together a, a network of regional partners to be able to channel members to participate in the international. Um, it will, though, be possible to join AWS directly in circumstances where, for example, you're operating across multiple regions, or if you're operating in a, regional, in a region where we don't yet have a partnership in place. Now, I'd just like to give you a sense of, of what those partnerships are. We've been working kind of behind the scenes to some extent to try and develop those partnerships for this rollout of the standard. Um, this map, I should say, is somewhat misleading because the grey area there might suggest there's not much happening there. That's not true. Uh, there's plenty happening, for example, in China where uh, Ecolab, for example, has been working uh, with WWF on, on applying the standard in a couple of facilities there. Really important work going on. But we don't have partners in place just yet for the, to help us with the delivery and help us with uh, the membership uh, activities. But what I can tell you is if you're in Asia Pacific, your go-to point in Asia Pacific is Water Stewardship Australia. Michael, who um, is busy eating chocolate cake at the moment, I believe, uh, but you know Michael because he was here a minute ago. He also, for those who don't know, leads Water Stewardship Australia. So he's the point person to go to this week if you have questions about uh, implementing water stewardship, implementing AWS standard, joining AWS in Asia Pacific. Uh, in South Asia, as uh, Dr. Bachari made out, we've been uh, uh, working closely with Terry. We're putting a partnership together with Terry. Also with Hindustan Unilever Foundation with a specific focus on community involvement in water stewardship. It's a really exciting uh, piece of the puzzle and very important in that context. And lastly, the Center for Responsible Business. Now, uh, I'm just would I don't want to point everybody out, but I would just like to uh, uh, acknowledge Bimal Arora. Bimal, could you want to stand up and say hello so the people know who you are? Thank you, Bimal G. Bimal leads uh, the the um, Center for Responsible Business, and he's come all the way over here to be with us today. So thanks for coming, Bimal. In Africa. Um, these are the two logos you see up on the screen now. They're not necessarily our partners, but they're, they're the, the key players for helping us find those partners. So we're just about to launch a, a, a project with GIZ, with funding through the UK Department of International Development, to identify appropriate partners in Africa and really roll out water stewardship in Africa. So it's, watch, that, watch this space for that one, but it's a really important piece of the puzzle. In Europe, our go-to point will remain the European Water Partnership, specifically European Water Stewardship. Sergei Moroz is here from somewhere from there up the back. He'll make himself known to, to everybody who wants to engage in Europe. In North America is the Water Council based out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And here in Latin America we're going to continue working with our partners uh, Fundacion FEMSA. Uh, CALCA, the Water Center for Latin America and the Caribbean, and also Fundacion Chile. So this gives you a sense of where we are. This is a moving space, it's evolving. S you know, keep, keep engaged and come and ask if it's, if it's not clear who your point of engagement is. But that, the, it's just to exemplify, the, to emphasize that the model is one which is very much based on partnerships at a local and at a regional level. Thank you. And thank you, Adrian. Uh, I'd now like to ask uh, uh, one of those regional partners that Adrian just mentioned, uh, um, and also a member of the ISDC, to very briefly just respond. Um, and he would be known to a lot of the people in the room, uh, Dr. Axel Dorangenet. 
uh, has a long and distinguished career in the water, energy and natural resources industry in Peru and Latin America generally. He is a former president of the Supreme Water Council in Peru. He also spent 22 years as director of natural resources and energy at the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Dr. Dronje. Bien, voy a darle un poco de trabajo a los traductores. How is your Spanish to everybody here? It has been, we have been talking in English, everybody. I don't know if you have at hand uh, to translate something. But anyway, I will be very short. I just uh, want to say that I'm very glad to be here. Uh, Fundación Chile, it's uh, already an enterprise which is public and private, so it fits very well to the endeavor that we are looking now to, to apply this uh, standard. Uh, I was glad to participate in the committee that was, has been de developing the standard and especially uh, I very thank you to Alexis and all the team that has been working on that. And uh, we are looking at Fundación Chile really to apply this uh, standard and to promote it. And we are, uh, at this very moment, we are supported by the government of Switzerland with Swiss Agua and we are applying this uh, with different enterprises, uh, calculating the water footprint. At the same time, we try to engage them on social responsibility and the river basin where they're located. So we are, we are looking really forward to participate and still supporting this uh, uh, task which uh, will compromise everybody here. Thank you very much. Bring up the next presentation. Do you want the next presentation? Yeah. So, uh, yes. yeah. Pre damper. Damper. Yeah. So I think it would be remiss of us if we didn't uh, tell you a bit about how we work with our corporate partners. I think one of the things that we've been very successful at is actually starting to put some results on the ground rather than just talk in a theoretical sense about water stewardship. Uh, and so I'd like to introduce to you uh, today uh, the uh, Peruvian uh, agribusiness organisation DANPA, uh, who've been trialling water stewardship in the north of Peru uh, in uh, Trujillo. Uh, Freddy uh, Cruzado is the company's quality assurance research and development and environment health and safety manager. Freddie will speak to us in Spanish today, so English speakers should, who don't speak Spanish uh, should reach for their headphones and, uh, and put them on. Thank you, Freddie. Thanks for coming along. Buenas noches a todos y bienvenidos al Perú. Eh, primero agradeciendo a la Alianza por habernos invitado a participar en este proyecto. Eh, vamos a compartir con ustedes brevemente nuestra experiencia en esta norma que consideramos importante para la gestión sostenible del agua. Eh, Damper es una empresa peruana que tiene mucha experiencia en implementación de sistemas de gestión Eh, tenemos implementados sistemas en gestión de calidad, en seguridad alimentaria, salud ocupacional, sistemas medioambientales, sistemas sociales y consideramos importante aceptar el reto que nos planteó uno de nuestros clientes para implementar la norma de gestión sostenible del agua que es la que hemos trabajado a nivel piloto. Eh, en este proyecto hemos participado eh, muchas organizaciones a las que a las cuales quiero agradecer, ¿no? eh, queremos agradecer a, a The National Conservancy, que fue facilitador, a, a la Alianza Water Stewardships, que coordinaron todo el proyecto, SGS, que participaron como observadores en la auditoría de la implementación piloto, a SECO y a COP, que eh, fueron los patrocinadores de este evento. ¿no? Eh, COP, por ser un cliente nuestro, que nos invitó a participar. Eh, ¿Qué es lo que nos invita a, a, o qué es lo que nos motiva en Damper? Eh, en Damper, en primer, eh, nosotros tomamos contacto con este estándar a través de la invitación de uno de nuestros clientes en Suiza y considerando que Damper eh, tiene eh, dentro de su misión 
eh, el hecho de ser una empresa sostenible en el tiempo, cuidando los ejes económicos, social y ambiental. Entonces, nosotros vimos que al ser un negocio altamente dependiente del agua, es importante involucrarnos eh, en este estándar, ¿no? Eh, y, la, y una forma de hacerlo es implementándolo para poder este, ver cuáles son los riesgos que vamos a tener a futuro con este recurso fundamental para nuestro negocio. ¿En dónde lo hemos implementado? Nosotros tenemos varios fondos en la costa de, del Perú y este ensayo lo hemos implementado en el fondo Muchic, que está ubicado en Crujillo y en nuestra planta de empaque de fresco. Eh, este fondo donde hemos trabajado tiene, eh, el, está inmerso en dos cuencas. Eh, físicamente está ubicado en la cuenca de Río Moche, pero el agua que utiliza proviene de la cuenca de Río Santa ya que este fondo está irrigado con aguas que provienen del proyecto Chavimochi. Eh, el uso que le damos al agua en estos fondos y en esta planta es principalmente para riego tecnificado, riego por goteo, y también en la planta de empaque para todos los procesos de procesamiento, lavado de las materias primas y para lo que es proceso de desinfección. En esta planta de empaque todo el producto se exporta como producto fresco. Eh, ¿Qué hemos tenido como resultado de la auditoría de piloto? En esta auditoría que fue eh, ejecutada por SGS, nosotros solamente hemos trabajado los tres, los tres primeros pasos, ¿no? de los seis que veíamos en las exposiciones anteriores, hemos trabajado tres que son los pasos básicos. El primer paso que es el compromiso gerencial, nosotros eh, publicamos, eh, modificamos nuestra política de gestión y le hemos publicado y le hemos difundido al interior de la organización. Eh, existen otros indicadores que están establecidos en el estándar que faltan este, trabajarlo con más detalle porque eh, necesitamos ser mucho más específicos para el cumplimiento de este principio. Con respecto a lo que es el proceso y recopilación de la información, eh, hemos visto que si bien es cierto cumplimos con todos los indicadores, nos falta muchísima información sobre la cuenca madre y sobre las áreas importantes de reserva hídrica. ¿no? Por ejemplo, en el caso del agua de, del proyecto Chaimochik, una de sus fuentes es el Parque Nacional Huascarán. Entonces, tenemos que identificar eh, qué otras áreas como la del Parque Nacional de Huascarán existen que podrían más adelante eh, requerir un cuidado especial. Eh, ¿Qué otro tema también hemos identificado que tenemos pendiente? Es elaborar una matriz para poder entender los impactos y los riesgos hídricos. Si bien es cierto, al interior, al interior del fondo, al interior de la empresa, tenemos identificado riesgos e impactos, pero no lo hemos trabajado con entes externos. Esta es la primera norma que trabajamos en Damper, en la cual vemos que existe mucha necesidad de interactuar con entes externos. Llámense otras empresas que también trabajan en la cuenca, eh, organizaciones del Estado, eh, ONGs, organismos que estén vinculados, certificados, porque es importante que este estándar no se trabaje de manera aislada en una sola organización, porque hay mucha información que hace falta y necesitamos trabajarlo con otras empresas. Eh, en el tema de planeamiento, por ejemplo, nosotros hemos visto que cumplimos con toda la parte legal al interior de la empresa, pero nos falta desarrollar un plan de gestión, un plan de gestión del agua, porque el, el, al ser este un recurso fundamental para nuestro negocio, necesitamos eh, comenzar a, a interactuar con otros actores del, de la cuenca para poder... Este, hacer un mejor uso del agua, evitar eh, contaminación de la, en, en otras fuentes, en, en otros orígenes y que en algún momento no nos, nuestro negocio no se vea afectado. ¿no? Pero además también nos interesa eh, hacer una mejor relación con la comunidad. ¿no? Eh, aquí sabemos que en el Perú el agua es una fuente principal de los grandes conflictos que tenemos. Entonces necesitamos interactuar con otros órganos de la comunidad. ¿Qué beneficios hemos identificado para nosotros como Damper? En primero hemos visto que es factible la integración de los sistemas de gestión que exige la norma WS con la información que tenemos en los otros sistemas de gestión. La metodología es la misma, sigue el ciclo de planear, hacer, verificar y actuar. O sea, sigue el mismo ciclo de mejora continua. 
hemos visto que al implementar esta norma nos otorga un conocimiento de las fuentes de agua que nos va a permitir hacer un análisis estratégico para una mayor participación en la cuenca, porque nos va a permitir acceder a información del manejo de la cuenca, manejo de información sobre las reservas hídricas, que nos va a permitir ir proyectándonos en el tiempo y poder identificar posibles faltas de, de este recurso. Al identificar eh, la criticidad de este recurso, nos va a obligar a implementar sistemas de manejo al interno que nos generen ahorros. Y al generar ahorros en consumo de agua nos va a generar reducción en costos operativos. Y eso es un beneficio que también estamos viéndolo al dinero de la empresa. Si cuidamos el agua, estamos asegurando la sostenibilidad de nuestro negocio. Estamos asegurando el negocio por muchos años más. Eh, cuidando el agua también vamos a fortalecer nuestras relaciones con los grupos de interés, con las otras comunidades que hacen uso del agua y lo más importante es que nos otorga una ventaja competitiva en la cadena de suministro, porque como lo decían al inicio, calidad hacen todos, seguridad alimentaria hacen todos y lo que tenemos que hacer es comenzar a diferenciarnos y consideramos que este es un elemento de diferenciación. ¿Qué desafío hemos identificado en esto? En primer lugar, que eh, con respecto a la información, falta mucha información a nivel de gestores y a nivel de autoridades. Hemos encontrado, por ejemplo, información que está desfasada, información que data del año 2000, ¿no? organizaciones estatales que no tienen información de la cuenca. Entonces, para poder hacer un manejo sostenible del agua necesitamos involucrar a autoridades y a las entes del gobierno. ¿Qué más hemos identificado? Por ejemplo, que nos falta mucha información sobre el agua virtual. ¿Cuántos litros de agua van o se necesitan por cada frasco de producto que exportamos o por cada kilo de producto que exportamos? Esto nos, nos lleva a comenzar a trabajar ya la huella hídrica de nuestros productos o de nuestros procesos. ¿no? Eh, nos interesa también trabajar con los proveedores porque utilizamos muchos insumos, muchos materiales y cuando le preguntamos a los proveedores cuál es tu consumo de agua, tampoco conocían esos detalles. Entonces, es importante que... Eh, comencemos a trabajar ya al externo de la organización. ¿Qué más nos falta? Es desarrollar el plan de gestión sostenible del agua, considerando los perfiles de riesgo, y lo más importante, involucrar a otros grupos de interés y autoridades. Entonces, conversábamos eh, temprano la posibilidad, por ejemplo, de que en Crujillo hagamos alianzas con la Cámara de Comercio, con quienes hicimos la primera alianza para las capacitaciones iniciales, para poder ir incorporando otras organizaciones de la zona que nos permitan trabajar en esta norma. ¿Qué lecciones nos ha dejado este, este proyecto piloto? En primero, que la implementación del estándar AWS es totalmente factible y aplicable en nuestros fondos y en nuestros procesos. En segundo lugar, es que necesitamos ordenar e integrar toda la información pero bajo el enfoque de la gestión sostenible del agua, o sea, ir más allá de nuestra organización, ir más allá de nuestras fronteras y de nuestro sitio. Eh, ¿Qué otra lección nos deja? Es que es importante conocer cuáles son las fuentes que este tiene recurso, que, cuáles son los orígenes del agua y sobre todo qué se está haciendo para conservarla. Conociendo eso sabemos que nuestro negocio va a ser mucho más sostenible en el tiempo. Y una última conclusión que tenemos es que necesitamos que las autoridades se involucren más en dos niveles, consideramos. Uno es que generen la información y el otro es que se, se involucren implementando el estándar. Porque si, por ejemplo, la autoridad eh, que maneje el proyecto Chaimochi se involucra implementando el estándar AWS, tendremos mucha información para todas las empresas que estamos en la zona que nos va a permitir poder acceder a esa información y desarrollar mejores planes de gestión. Entonces, eso es básicamente el resumen lo que quería compartir con ustedes. ¿no? Gracias por su atención. Muy amable. Thanks, Freddie, and that's a great story. Um, we were going to now just have a couple of words from uh, Christian uh, Robin from uh, the um, Swiss State Secretariat for Economic Affairs, uh, just to, to uh, briefly talk about their interest in this project and promoting water stewardship. Christian, I think people are probably getting a bit hungry, so maybe just a quick couple of minutes.
Good evening to everybody. Michael kindly invited me to say a few words about uh, why a donor uh, like SECO supports the, such a standard, at least the pilot phase in Trujillo, but we are very, very interested in, in starting a partnership with you. And actually this uh, question is not so easy to respond because uh, SECO is part of a Ministry of Economy. Our mandate is actually promoting trade. And uh, at the first glance, it seems that water and promoting trade is not necessarily directly linked. But what we see and what we perceive is really a great potential to get to a win-win situation. Uh, in Switzerland, in Europe, and I think in, every, in different places, uh, big retailers in Switzerland is Coop and Migro. They are highly interested in considering sustainability issues, in considering sustainable management of natural resources into their value chain development. And there, as we see, real, uh, the potential to have a concrete impact on on the management, on the sustainable management of natural resources at the local level by market instruments. And, um, and often in context, we have to say is the, frankly, in context where the governance context, where the, uh, the compliance with national rules is not always given. So this potential to, to, to back our resources on sustainability is really highly interest uh, for us. Uh, for this reason, uh, Swiss cooperation as SECO, we have been promoting for many years sustainability strand, uh, standards in many sectors. We are, so, uh, we are working closely together with ISEAL, somehow an umbrella organization, trying to make quality assurance, trying to uh, put forward the harmonization agenda among the different uh, standards. And we are aware that the sustainability standards, it's not the perfect world. I mean, a lot has to do to improve the, the, uh, the, the words of the standards, but we have always, we also have to be aware that in the current context, in the current of the WTO, there is no consideration in international trade rooms of the so-called PPMs. So that's there, uh, the, OMC, uh, the WTO doesn't differ between a pr uh, product which is produced in a sustainable way and a, a product which doesn't, uh, uh, which does do consider, doesn't consider sustainability issues. In this context, we think that sustainability uh, standards has a lot to offer, and that's the reason why we are supporting this. I think with the Alliance for Water uh, Stewardship, we have a standard of the latest generations considering new topics, and I think we are really enthusiastic to see how it works in the field. And I think all of us, we have a, a keen uh, interest, we have also a concrete responsibility to put the agenda forward, and as uh, for, uh, from our side, we're really happy and also a bit proud to be part of this pilot. So thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, Christian. I think one of the things we've found when uh, we're working with companies and organizations is that the, the longer we work with them, the more rewards we're able to show. And I'm reminded, listening to those presentations of a company we've been working with back in Australia for six years. Um, over that time, they've reduced their demand for potable water by 70%. They're able to process their wastewater now to a point where it's usable by other industries. So they've got an output that they can actually, uh, is a product rather than a waste material. Uh, they've reached out to their local communities who they didn't really understand previously. And they're able to engage those communities in wetland restoration and in, in riparian area restoration. They've become involved in water governance forums. Uh, they've used the principles of water stewardship to, to guide their whole water strategy. And they've gone from being named as one of the uh, worst water users at the height of the drought to a whole series of awards, and not just superficial awards, but awards in their supply chain. One of the first to recognise them was one of their biggest customers, a retailer, who recognised them in their sustainability awards back in 2009. The second year, they won the Prime Minister's water Water Prize. And then just a couple of weeks ago, uh, McDonald's issued its report on its Sustainable Supply Chain Awards, and they took out the Global Award uh, for the Best Performer in Water. 
Christmas. So I think that's a, a fairly proud statement of how we've been able to work with organisations and really bring them on a journey that not only delivers impacts to communities, but real benefits to this company, which has uh, managed to obtain economic benefit because they've been able to reduce their uh, water demand in a cost-effective way, massive risk reductions, and when we first met them, they're at risk of having one of their plants closed down and huge reputational benefits as well. Um, so I thought I was just briefly mentioning that case study as one of the longest we've been in, involved with. One of the things that I need to do is to recognise uh, the people that have come on this journey with us. And they're the people who are on the slide in front of you now. And it's a mixture of our founding partners, uh, new uh, companies that have signed up as founding partners recently, companies that have supported us all the way through this process, our regional partners and our board members. There's a lot of organisations and people who've contributed to where we are today and it's not just a few people sitting around the table. So I would uh, ask you to consider uh, what Adrian was talking about a, a moment ago, that we have the system now, we're putting it in place and all it needs is organisations such as the companies represented on the mandate to really uh, get involved more and, and make it work and deliver the sort of outcomes we've been uh, talking about. So I'd, I'd just like to thank them for their generosity and foresight in the, the development of this program. Please uh, seek out either Adrian or myself or any of the other board members or Alexis uh, if you are interested in talking more to us about this. So there's only one item left on my agenda and hopefully we're still going to do this but it was uh, our intention to in, uh, invite you all to join us for a drink uh, to celebrate this evening. Um, but just before we did that I wanted to share a short video which is recorded by our North American regional director who went down to her local brewery to find out what they thought of water stewardship. The, the video, the last video. This one. Oh, you have another now, yeah? That's for water stewardship in North America. I'm here today with the Water Council staff at Fred's Pub at Miller Coors to ask, why is water important? Because you need water to make beer. It's the beer. It's the beer. Water is important because it's an essential component of life. It comprises 70% of the Earth's surface and 75% of our bodies. Right, guys? It's yeah. the beer. It's the beer. <laughs> in all seriousness, in Wisconsin, we know that water is critical to our landscapes, our economies, and our quality of life. Actually, the high life. That's why the Water Council works with members like Miller Coors to advance the principles of water stewardship. Today we raise a toast to the Alliance for Water Stewardship, the launch of the International Water Stewardship Standard, and our future work together. Cheers! Cheers. Okay, that's it. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to the AWS team for this great overview and congratulations on the launch once again, please, really. Um, because we lost some time and are a bit behind in the program, what we'd suggest is that we, unfortunately and with apologies, skip the 20 minute break, um, have a five to seven minute break, a stretch if you will, uh, stay close by and then we'll resume the program and pick up the, the final two agenda items. Thank you.